All right, what's up, gang? We are back. It has been a few minutes. Uh, and i um, trying to finish up these chapters and get on to Ren's new song, Troubles. Um, it's a rainy, rainy Friday. Is it Friday? It is Friday. Friday, May 10th. Um, and um, we're just going to try to knock these out. So anyway, with uh, no more jabbering from me, we're going we're gonna to go. Here we go. Chapter 7 Before he even had the test results, the doctor in Brussels glanced up from the form he'd asked me to fill out, and he said, You have Lyme disease. We can run the tests, but I'm certain of it. I'd heard of Lyme in passing during my hours trolling the internet, but I'd never spent long diving into it. It was an extremely rare disease in the UK that you can get from tick bites, so it never really came across my radar. I sat, sat there, puzzled for a moment. I said, um, can I get better? He said that many people go on to recover, some don't. Right. I wanted to ask him so many questions, but my mind at that moment was totally blank. The test results eventually came back, sure enough, positive for Lyme, and the co-infection Bartonella, along with many other biomarkers which suggested autoimmunity and immune dysfunction. My whole life, I'd been waiting for this moment, to have something printed on a piece of paper that showed that I wasn't actually fucking crazy that I could shove in the faces of anyone who'd made me feel like a hypochondriac or like a head case. But when the moment finally came, I felt numb. It was hard to rejoice. I had a lingering PTSD from the psychotic meltdown the year before, which made it pretty hard to break into the realms of happiness. Instead, I did what I always do. I got home and I took to the internet and I researched the best ways to escape. The summer that I got sick, I spent two weeks camping in a small festival in Dorset. One night, me and friends decided to climb a nearby hill to build a bonfire in the woods. On the way there, the fields were full of long grass and deer. Three people, all my age, who all attended that festival came down with ME or fibromyalgia-like symptoms over the course of the next year. One was a friend of the family who was shot in a dark room for years because the light would be too intense for him. Before that festival, he was bursting with life, a successful capoeira dancer reduced to a zombie. Lyme disease seemed to be as much of a medical labyrinth as ME was. On one side, there was a whole host of specialists who believed Lyme bacteria becomes chronic, evades the immune system response, can sometimes evade testing, and leads to debilitating symptoms unless treated with a long course of antibiotics. On the other side were doctors who claimed that Lyme can't persist, it's easily treatable with a two-week course of doxycycline and further symptoms following that must be due to an autoimmune response triggered by the Lyme or perhaps an unrelated, undiscovered cause. I educated myself as best as I could on all theories, trawling through research papers on PubMed, conversing people in support groups, often contacting leading Lyme scientists via email or phone to ask them questions. Lyme disease is caused by Borrelia, a spirochete bacteria that causes symptoms like extreme fatigue, confusion, joint pain, heart problems, digestive issues, anxiety, depression, and, and in extreme cases, hallucinations. So everything was adding up. I fell down internet rabbit holes of learning how Borrelia produces outer membrane vesicles, which contain outer surface proteins which can modulate your entire immune response, essentially dampening it for its own survival. It was a truly insidious pathogen, a smart one, one out of a, trist, a twisted horror sci-fi. There would be online groups claiming it was created in a lab in Plum Island off America and weaponized. Due to the widespread suffering it seemed to cause, and given how hard it was to treat, it was easy, how to, see, it was easy to see how people gravitated towards these sorts of superstitions and speculations. The main thing that made my head swim was the sheer number of treatment options, in part a byproduct of the cognitive dissonance in the medical industry at the time. There were countless antibiotic protocols, herbal protocols, immune system modulating protocols, wackier ones where people would be stinging themselves with bees or swallowing certain helminth parasites to modulate their immune systems. It was a wild west, and I wasn't so naive to be unaware that there were a lot of quacks in that space, selling people snake oil, financially taking advantage of desperation. Like a lot of the medical industry, I despise people and companies who see opportunity to profit from other people's misery. If you're watching this video, and you're one of those people, I would highly consider switching your role in the world and being on the right side. One common factor a lot of these protocols seemed to share was you would certainly get a lot worse before you got any better. There was something called the Jarish Herxheimer reaction. As you kill off the pathogens in your system, they release biotoxins in your body, which are eventually cleared out by your kidneys and liver. 
These can cause systemic inflammation, additional fatigue, brain fog, mood swings, pain, flu-like feelings. I was no stranger to these things already, but when they got even worse, it was a mental battle. I sought out as many success stories as I could, and I looked for common threads in the ones of the people who made a full recovery. It seemed like long courses of antibiotics were working for some people, but to do it safely I needed to be in the care of a specialist. The NHS were fucking useless. After multiple appointments, one with an infectious disease specialist, they told me the most they could give me was a couple week course of doxycycline. I knew that probably wouldn't be enough. They told me chronic Lyme wasn't something that they recognised. I presented them with printouts of much of the research I'd gathered online for the most recent studies which they dismissed. One of them told me I seemed obsessed and they asked me if I thought about getting a hobby. I fantasised about dragging him by his tie across his desk and pressing a stapler into his skull. Then I politely got up and left. Doxycycline would lead to improvements for a short time frame and then my symptoms would come creeping back. I tried many antibiotic and herbal approaches to treat the Lyme without much luck. I tried things like Rife treatment, which is essentially running an electromagnetic pulse through your body in hopes that it would kill the bacteria. I was desperate. It seemed that America took Lyme disease far more seriously than the UK, which made sense as it was far more prominent there. I settled on a doctor called Dr. Jemsack over in Washington, and when I could, I would busk or I'd sell music online to raise money. My girlfriend at the time also ran a fundraiser, and my mum said that she'd also help contribute towards flights. It's not easy being sick and broke, but somehow we made it work. A week before I was due to fly out, something happened which changed my whole life. I've always been a believer in the good that you're putting out in the world coming back to you. Luck, therefore, is more of a karmic consequence. When I was making video blogs, I wasn't doing it to build a following or for any sort of social merit or personal gain. I was doing it because I thought I was going to die. I was doing it because I wanted to feel like I'd left some sort of positive mark on the world, like I'd helped. I remember w waking up one morning and going through the comment section of the latest video I'd posted, only to find a message from a British doctor who was running a clinic over in Germany in Los Angeles. He's the f the, he is the third and final angel of this story. He was reaching out to offer to help, and he didn't want anything in return. We exchanged messages and ended up jumping on a video call together. The angel explained that he sympathised with my story. His son was a musician, and at his clinic he'd seen firsthand the countless times the destruction that Lyme disease was causing. He explained his clinic was involved in cutting-edge stem cell procedures and seeing promising results for various autoimmune and Lyme pa patients. The cost of the procedure was upwards of $25,000, something that I could never afford. But he said that every year he personally selected patients to attend his clinic for free. He would offer me the treatment free of charge. All he wanted me to do was document my experience. It made sense to me that if Borrelia was able to modulate the immune system for its own survival, that an intervention that focused on immunological homeostasis would help. The clinic also offered antibacterial IVs targeting the Lyme and various other treatments intended to build the body back up after years of chronic health complications. I was kind of in shock. When a stranger reaches out and offers something so generous, it's natural to doubt his intentions, but something told me to trust this kind offer. I really had nothing to lose, and as morbid as it sounds, my willingness to die made it easy to throw myself into a more experimental procedure. There was also some security in the fact that he wanted me to document my experience and share it with the world. If it had been more sinister, surely he wouldn't want that sort of exposure. I decided that I'd still go to the in in initial consultation with Dr. Jemsek as I'd raised the money, but I would catch a flight to LA once it was done. Money was still an issue. The entire treatment length was about six weeks and back then I could have never afforded the accommodation for that long. I decided to hop on Facebook and I found a Lyme support group based in LA. There, I found people going through the treatment at the clinic who were happy to put me up in their guest rooms. Despite all our faults, human beings' ability to empathize, lift up strangers and collectively solve problems purely because it's the right thing to do is such a beautiful characteristic to carry. I sincerely hope that we can find ways to hold on to our own empathy and humanity as we step into the future. I believe these traits will save us as a species. Survival of the fittest is a myth in a society where we have all our basic needs met. It becomes survival of those willing to cooperate. The time came and I flew out to America with Momoko, keeping me company and keeping an eye out in case my health crashed. I went to the initial consultation in Washington DC. They re recommended that I get on a minimum of a year-long course of various antibiotics and supplements, some to be rotated. I saw this as my fallback plan if the stem cells didn't work. We then headed to LA. It was summertime, so it was boiling. The clinic was based in Beverly Hills. 
The juxtaposition of spending most of my life in waiting rooms that were falling apart, feeling like a defective product on a conveyor belt that's being rushed along only to be dismissed, to then go into being in what felt like a five-star health spa where there seemed to be a genuine care and interest for my well-being was quite odd. I was greeted enthusiastically by the doctor. He seemed a lot younger than his age. When I mentioned this, he laughed and he said it was the stem cells. As we spoke, I could see his childlike enthusiasm for what they were doing at the clinic. Stem cells were very in vogue at the time. There was also much territory to explore and the potential of what they could offer harder to treat diseases was incredibly exciting and promising. It was hard not to feel some of that contagious excitement leaking from the doctor. He explained that because I've been sick and misdiagnosed for so long, it wasn't gonna be easy. There was no magic fix. At times I might feel like giving up, but I should trust the process. So I did. When we first arrived, I was staying on the floor of a young couple's apartment. They were just starting treatment at the clinic. Fontaine was a songwriter and he was an actor. One night he asked me if I liked bikes and then he took me out on the back of his Harley Davidson and drove at high speed through the hills surrounding LA. It was interesting talking to Fontaine about her experience. I'd found people I could relate to online, but very rarely did I meet people in person whose experience had mir mirrored my own. She'd also been through the ringer of misdiagnoses, medical dismissal, left to suffer, trying desperately to claw back her own life. I started to realize this problem wasn't localized to the UK. It was global. So many people were going missing and screaming into a void. The first week at the clinic was aimed at building my body back up. I would sit for hours while various vitamins and nutrients were dripped into my body to address any deficiencies that may have occurred from years of being sick. They also offer talk therapy, lymphatic drainage massage, ways to calm your nervous system that would aid healing. I was still having to pinch myself that this was all free. I felt guilty for the people who had to pay. It wasn't easy. Occasionally I'd have an immune reaction to one of the IV drips. I didn't know at the time but I had mast cell activation syndrome, which meant my body would become highly inflamed in response to many food, vitamins, even things like perfumes or scents from everyday cleaning products could set it off. A year later, while in the German clinic, I would be minutes away from nearly dying after going into anaphylactic shock during an IV drip. A nurse luckily caught me in the nick of time and injected me with an EpiPen. I spent a night in the emergency ward with Germans who couldn't speak a word of English who put me on an electrolyte drip that made me feel even worse. During the second week in LA, I moved places to stay with another couple. The husband had been a prop and set designer for the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. They were extremely generous with their time and space and became almost surrogate parents to me and Momoko. There is an unusual companionship you feel with someone who has faced similar levels of suffering as yourself, like an unspoken bridge of understanding. At the time, I was having difficulties with my girlfriend. I wanted her to come with me to LA as this felt like a pretty pivotal moment in my life. It was a time where I really just wanted to feel safe, but she couldn't take the time off work. I think I felt a little bit funny about the fact Momoko had made the time and, and sacrificed her own work and she hadn't. She was being distant with me whenever we spoke on the phone, which frustrated me more and more. We ended up arguing a fair bit. I think this was the beginning of seeds that would soon grow into finding it extremely difficult to be in relationships in general. I usually feel pretty unlovable, extremely isolated, very antisocial. I felt alienated, often bitter that most people go through their lives not knowing what it's like to hurt every day. That they didn't appreciate the freedom their bodies allowed them as they should. To be alive and to not hurt is a blessing. To be alive and not hurt is all I want. The day, f the day of the stem cell transplant finally arrived, and I was nervous, as you would be getting a giant fucking metal rod shoved into your skin. The doctors offered me an anti-anxiety med, and I was never one to turn down free drugs. With autologous stem cell transplant, they take cells from your own fat, centrifuge them, and then do some magic science shit and then feed them back to you in an IV. To acquire these cells, they have to do liposuction. The issue was I was already skinnier than a shadow on a cloudy day. They would usually take the fat from the stomach, but as they had virtually no body fat, they had to go in through the back near my coccyx. They spent about 20 minutes soaring away at your insides and separating your muscle from fat. Then they inject you with a liquid that breaks it down and they suck it back out. Fresh for the stem cell harvest. There's a video of me drugged up and laughing as a needle as big as my forearm gets rammed into my back. I returned home pretty bruised up, but full of hope. Like, uh, like they're digging for gold. And um, so I'm pretty kind of bruised up. I've got these two little holes here where they took the stem cells out and they put them back in my arm. You can't really see on this camera because the light's too much, but I've got more holes in my arm than a Scottish heroin addict. I'd met people at the clinic who were further along the process than me, who were singing the praises of how much better they felt. 
For the first three months, I didn't really notice much, but I was told it would take time. I was already doing ba somewhat better from the six weeks of IVs. It's an unusual psychological space to be teetering on the precipice of hope that your whole life could change. There's a certain tension and a certain excitement that comes with that. I was also having big problems with my girlfriend at the time. I'd found out some things that had really shaken my trust. In retrospect, I should have just walked away then and there, but I held on because part of me blamed myself. In my sickness, I held people at a distance, so I felt like I deserved negative things. We would fight a lot. The health problems added a whole new dimension to something that would be hard for any couple. I couldn't trust that she loved me as much as she said she did because of certain things that I found out. A few months after the transplant, me and her decided to get away from everything and stay with her mother on the south of Spain. One night, we were sat on the grass, looking up at the sky, being surrounded by avocado and lemon trees. It felt like we were in some sort of Eden-like paradise. She asked me to marry her. It was her way of proving that she loved me and would always love me. And I said yes, but I meant no. Even when we went to pick out rings, I just felt scared. I lost the ability to trust love. I don't fully blame her for that. She was an awesome person trying to navigate a complicated situation. I blame my sickness. My sickness was an inseparable for me, and so I blame myself. After about a month of being home, she sat down with me one day and told me she decided to move to Australia for a year. She told me it wouldn't change anything between us. I had my doubts. Despite the additional stress in my life, something amazing was happening. About four months after the stem cell transplant, I noticed the, the desire to leave the house. I noticed more color in my skin. I joined a gym that was a three minute walk from my house. I started working out for the first time in years. Music started pouring back into my life. I was singing more, I was producing more, and this was all leading up to my favourite chapter so far. This real fast. Um, this I'm on a new medical protocol, and um, I, I think it's interesting. Um, it's four medications that I have to take for the next two months. Two medications are for human beings and, and two are for cattle. Um, I had to, uh, the only way I could get them was, was uh, um, in a way that they're meant to uh, be given to horses and uh, cows, goats. So anyway. Um, what Ren was saying about these weird protocols that have you on all these different things that yeah that's what I'm, I'm trying right now um, when I when I found out that I was going to have issues with this for possibly for, for the rest of my life and then I came home and I, and I got online and I, I started looking up things you don't, you can't find chronic Lyme, or at least you couldn't back then. Like it just, and like Rand said, they did. They, they people said they didn't recognize it as a thing, but yet it's it's obvious with anyone. Most the majority of people who have had Lyme disease, that there is a there is a thing that you carry with you afterwards that is, is still there. Um, it's not, it's not gone. You know, the pain might be gone. Um, like Ren said that he, he has these pains that, in his legs and his shins. And I, I don't have pain, but my legs are my biggest 
adversaries. As far as the neuropathy go, um, the ref restless leg syndrome, um, I'll lay down to, uh, I'll lay down to sleep and I'll, I'll try to read and I could lay on my stomach and, and read and at some point my legs will just be kicking the mattress, um, trying to shake the phantom feelings that are shooting through my, my shins and my knees and my, my ankles and my, you know, and my, and my feet, they itch, you know, I can't have the socks on, now the feet are cold and I, now I put the socks on, those are make my feet itch, they've got to go, um, and it's just torture, it's torture with my legs, um, and with me it works its way up my back, um, to get a lot of itching on my back, shoulders, um, a lot of, a lot of my itching on my head, um, and, um, it's, it's, it, it's rough, it's rough, it's, and, um, they, there's, there's not enough being done on this, there's not enough, and this is what I really want, God, I want to, I want to talk with Ren so much just to compare notes, because I haven't been able to, I haven't been able to compare notes with anybody really, um, I haven't done the done the forums or, 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 or any of that. I've just pretty much been battling this on my own. Um, and I haven't been doing a very good job. Um, I haven't been winning very much. <sighs> Dogs. Um, all right. I think we got one chapter to go, and I think it's going to be one of the toughest ones for me. But we're going to go ahead and finish up with the uh, with uh, with uh, Ren and Sam here, which I believe they're going to be going on here doing blind eye. Um, Sam's got an amazing voice; um, he's an amazing singer, um, and I think he's he's extremely talented. And uh, on that note, let's go ahead and finish this up. Wishing that these bats 
frost will gone. Sometimes I guess, sometimes it's when it's like time is against me In my mind I kind of mind, yet on my mind it tortures me But I shine, cause when I shine it's like my shine they set me Survival of the fittest is a myth and a society Okay, I don't know what happened there. Um, what was that? Was that seven or eight? That don't look familiar. It was seven, right? I don't even know where we're at. Yeah. Oh, I guess... Did it, did it just cut off like that? Huh. Alright, well, anyway, great song. Um, um, love seeing them guys uh, performing. Um, and Ren looks like he, he enjoys busking so much. Um, I, and that's, that's strange to me. Um, I'm not a very outgoing person. This is a very un usual thing for me to be doing um, and um, I'm not real sure why I'm doing it um, I may be switching over um, off of these music reactions though um, I don't really have nobody's nobody's given me any recommendations um, and um, I've just heard a lot of music over my life so I think I'll probably might start switching to some some police uh, body cam videos and doing reactions on those and stuff um, but um, but I'm always gonna do a red a red reaction I mean he's I identify with everything he's going through everything he's saying um, his his experiences are so similar to my own um, as far as his illness goes and and the impacts on his life and and, and everything He's he's my son's age. Um, they were born the same year. Um, it's just so many things with Ren that remind me of my own life in some way. Um, whether it's me or my son or 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 an, or an experience, um, I, I identify with him so much, and it'd be amazing to have a conversation um, with him just a normal conversation I'm a fan but I'm I'm not I'm I'm never jaded by people um, by celebrities um, or people that are are well known um, I've had some jobs where I was um, very well known and um, uh, I'd go to you know the grocery store and people would recognize me and you know I have had conversations with people and and I know how that can be. Um, uh, I've met a lot of celebrities, um, uh, a lot of uh, sport sport athletes, famous athletes, um, and I'm normally not normally not one that's very um, impressed by by a celebrity. Uh, they're just they're just people like you and me, um, and uh, uh, many of them have uh, you know actors and stuff like that. They have numerous chances to do to get their job right you know take after take after take till they finally get it right um i'm like man i wish wish i got multiple takes at my job you know but anyway um 
Ren, you ever see it? I would love for us. To just, I'd, love, I'd love to just talk, chat, text, email. Um, it would be great. Um, I, I assume that you get a lot of stuff. I've never bothered to send you anything. Um, but, um, and uh, maybe that's my own fault. I, I, I did see that you responded to somebody's uh, uh, Facebook post uh, last night. Um, and uh, I thought that was very, thought that was very, very, very big of you, man. Very cool of you. Um, cause she seemed a little upset, and you were. That was awesome. Um, thank you for your message. Thank you for, you know, for trying to make us all better. All right, let's let's uh, sh I'm gonna shut up and let's wrap this thing up because I want to get to the new song. So, all right, let's go. Uh, let's go. We're gonna get off of here and uh. Come join me for the last one, Chapter 8. I got a feeling this one's really going to hit me hard for some reason. Um, all right, thanks, guys, and uh, later. <laughs>